Um, and thank you very much for this invitation. Um, it was an invitation to uh, share a particular history. Um, I'm going to introduce you to some key practitioners um, and teachers from a very particular moment in time and a very particular place. But the idea uh, on the invitation was to open that out, uh, to consider something of their legacy uh, in our digital times. Okay, I'm going to use my best teacher voice. You must be able to hear that. Um, uh, to kind of take the specific and open that out to a, a reflection about our digital times, but of course mediated through me, uh, through my own perspectives and my own concerns. Um, so those are the concerns of a maker. I'm not just a, uh, an academic, I actually make, uh, and there is evidence <laughs> of me. So this is me at New North Press. So I was invited to work on a project there. Um, so I'm a maker and I have very much approached the thinking about history and Nazi press from the perspective of a maker. Um, but I'm also a storyteller. Um, I have an interest and a concern for history. Um, and I am, uh, I'm always really keen to seek out letterpress stories, uh, on my travels. So this was when I was in Brazil in Sao Paulo. Um, and the guy there, the, um, the linotype operator was, had the nickname of Jacare, which is the alligator. So there were a lot of stories there. Um, so this concern for history, um, has also been born out in other projects that I've worked on. Um, a little bit about exploring, uh, digital tools in relation to the communication of history. Um, so this was a relatively recent project, um, uh, coordinated by one of my colleagues, uh, Priscilla Lena Farias, who's, um, a professor in, in Sao Paulo, the University of Sao Paulo. Um, printing came to Sao Paulo quite late, not until the 1820s. And for various political reasons, and she's been trying to track the story of who was printing what and where. Um, and so this is a website, Typographia Palestana, uh, and there are no type specimens. There's very little evidence of what was going on, but she found some almanacs which listed the names of people who were printing. And over the years, we've been able to track who was printing. Like I say, there were no uh, type specimens. So what she had was their advertising in the almanacs. And so we did like a reverse repertoire. So by looking and uh, digitizing and sourcing the types that they used to advertise their business, we've kind of been able to imagine what their typecases looked like without having any of their type specimen material. So it was this epic project that she coordinated with a lot of help from a lot of research students in the university, but there now is this kind of repertoire or database. And we can start to think about where the typefaces were coming from, what was being imported from Germany, what was coming from America, what was coming from France. Um, but I've also been writing a little bit more about history and uh, thinking a little bit more about how our histories of practice might be a little bit more accurate um, to better understand what we're doing, our creative pract practices and technologies of today. And certainly, uh, greater accuracy would improve uh, television crime drama. Um, because if anyone's come across this, this is a British classic, Midsummer Murders. Well, season 17, episode one, this man here, has been killed by letterpress. <laughs> and, so, and I just sat there thinking, what? So allegedly he's been wheeled kind of under the press. It's been come down on top of him. And I was just sat there thinking, but well, the type would have to be in the air and, and it would have to be sort of 300 point Times New Roman. And so, <laughs> it's just sort of hilariously wrong. Um, so, so there's a kind of, yeah, so better accuracy would help crime drama on TV. Um, but actually, there's a lot of mythologizing of the past that can happen outside of terrible TV, um, that often characterizes, um, lesser press discussions. And so I want to think a little bit, it's about those tropes, um, of the composing room as sort of being this kind of return to something lost, which happens a lot. So this romanticizing of letterpress past creeps into our design consciousness in various ways, um, not least everyday design journalism. So in this interview from Print Magazine, a designer is asked, what is it about letterpress that, you know, that made you dedicate a, devote a, a studio and a career to uh, continuing its traditions? And then the reply references this steeping of letterpress in history 
as an unquestionably good thing and the offer from the process of an uninterrupted feedback loop between design and production, digital and physical, history and present. Um, but if you actually look at history of how Letterpress worked, it was anything but simple. <laughs> so this kind of uh, mythologizing is something I've written a little bit about and been exploring. So the way I want to do that is to think about some very particular lessons in making uh, from the past in terms of the lessons in making they might have for us or what they might tell us about now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a very particular sequence of lessons. And the study I'm setting out is that of the composing room at Central St Martins, um, which is one of the constituent colleges of the University of the Arts in London. And this is the composing room in its current location, which is within the Granary Square building um, in London's King's Cross. And all of this began uh, in response to an invitation from Rose Gridniff, Alexander Cooper and Andrew Haslam to participate in this project. It was the Collaborative Letterpress Project to 6x6. And it was a project in which uh, staff and students from six educational institutions, as listed, were asked to reflect in words and uh, text and work um, on the significance of the location of their particular composing rooms. Um, so uh, this is my colleague, Phil Baines, uh, managing to celebrate the fact that our college is now, um, has been relocated to a, a, a railway goods yard, um, indulging his own serious train spotting habit by adding little trains. <laughs> And um, so from these early starting points, the study has continued. So I was able to document part of this in the project, but actually the story was interesting and I've continued with it. And so I'm able to elaborate a, li a little bit more on it. And particularly, I think the significance of what was happening. So about CSM, this point, I think, no, glasses are worse. <laughs> um, so about Central St. Martins. Central St. Martins is an amalgam of two colleges. Um, you have St. Martin's School of Art, which was established in the 1850s, um, and the Central School of Art, which was established in 1896. Both, in their own way, established a reputation um, in radical visual arts practice over the course of the 20th century. The two colleges were merged in 1989, at which point the separate composing rooms were amalgamated um, and they were relocated to the basement of the old Central School building, um, which is where I was when I was a student. So if we take the story of the Central School first, now this story is one really about trade orthodoxies. And it's about trade orthodoxies that kept design students well and truly out of the composing room. And it's a, a story which is about a very particular demarcation of typographic practice based around ideas of production. Um, and so one of the key characters I want to introduce you to is somebody called Anthony Frossel, um, and those are his dates. So he was a designer and in 1946, he wrote a note of gratitude to the printer Guido Morris. Guido Morris had um, a workshop in Cornwall, very remote workshop. Uh, and he wrote a note of thanks, having returned from a workshop with Morris and saying just a handle type, that was the unintended education that you gave me. Now for us, the idea that handling type could be a learning experience is, is so simple um, that it sounds, sounds like too obvious to say. We so take for granted the opportunities we have to touch type and to handle type, even within the sort of limited letterpress resource that we have of today. But actually, when you look back in the past, and especially in terms of the, the history of the Central School, it was an opportunity which was really, really hard won. From 37 until 39, Frostow was enrolled uh, in the School of Book Production, which as you can see changed its names as graphic design starts to emerge. Um, and he was a student um, and he was pursuing his interest in design and he was an, an emergent fascination with typography. But as he relates, I had never at art school been allowed to touch type. I once went into the room capitalised typography, and I saw J. H. Mason, who was the head of department, poised on his high clicker stool, who ordered me out. And such was the demarcation between the areas of design and production that any engagement of, for, uh, for the student of design with typography was always at this kind of distance. The design student, with little or no experience of the material that they were specifying, had to set out instructions for their typographic ambitions to be carried out by other people. 
Further, the specification process had to be open-ended enough for interpretation on the part of the compositor. Um, so Fossa was utterly frustrated by this lack of control, complained. No trade typesetter whom I met was prepared to set some layouts so accurate that they were as human beings given no freedom of decision. So not only were you not allowed to do the typesetting or touch the type yourself, when you specified how you wanted it to be, you had to give enough leeway for the compositor to make decisions for themselves. You couldn't control everything. Um, so contrary to our contemporary situation, the designer was often very far from being in control of their visual treatment of the typography. They had to accept a given set of trade norms, no means of being able to explore formal possibilities beyond these, and certainly no opportunity to for any way to be very hands-on with type. When he returns to the Central School as a lecturer in the early 1950s, and having reaped the benefits of actually what it was to touch type and just how educationally beneficial that could be, Fossa tried again to try to get access in the composing rooms on behalf of his students. But actually, as before, the power, such as the power of the trade unions at the time, it proved hard to overcome. Mason had retired, but he, in his place was an equally formidable character called uh, Mr. Avis, also unhappy with this idea that design students might have ac access to the printing presses. As Frosai recalls, we had great problems typesetting the, the layouts the students were making. As all the instructors were opposed to the idea of a designer, a self-taught compositor, you can almost hear him, like, and printer, having authority over them, and worse, wishing to let full-time National Diploma of Design students set type. And that was in spite of a government recommendation that they should be able to do that. Compositors had a seven-year training and they were not going to let go of that, um, that monopoly uh, easily. <laughs> And numerous unsuccessful confrontations with the printers, not to mention lots of other people. I have to say, Anthony Fossa was not the easiest of characters on many levels. Um, so he was dismissed, quite quickly dismissed from the college, but he had a stroke of genius in terms of his timetabling before he left. And here's the, the second main character, um, Edward Wright. So in 1951, Anthony Frossau asked the designer and artist Edward Wright to outline a typography evening course at the Central School, which Wright would go on to deliver between 52 and 56. Reflecting back on these classes in 1985, Wright says, Frossau gave me the idea and the opportunity to try out what Lawrence Garing has aptly called extempore typography. The method was to arrive at a design or typographic statement by moving printing units around on the bed of an Albion press while making a series of impressions from wood letter and other type high printing units. The classes were held in the evening and in an atmosphere of subterfuge. It was like sneaking around at night. Um, and they've been anecdotally described as being like a midnight feast with kids at school. Um, and they've kind of become the stuff of legend. The reason for the subterfuge was just that the composing room and access to it was still a very ter territorial issue. In her 2013 doctoral thesis, Edward Wright, artist, designer and teacher, Anne Pillar sets out a brilliant overview of the work and writing of Wright. I can't recommend it enough as a piece of writing. Pilar describes the print room compositors headed by Mr. Avis, trained in letterpress apprenticeships, would not have countenanced Edward Wright's teaching methods and usage of the press, which broke trade union rules and craft practices of make ready and standards of press work in the main applicable to book printing. Pilar characterizes further what these unorthodox practices were, explaining that whereas Edward Wright's colleagues in the Department of Book Production um, including Herbert Spencer and Anthony Froschel, rarely used type over 14 points, Edward Wright's students deployed large wooden letter forms and letterpress furniture, set up on the bed of the press and printed in a somewhat rough and ready manner. In this way, Wright's evening classes can be seen as a model for the kind of experimental exercises that came to characterise basic design. It's one of the two broad theories um, that integrated, instigated dramatic changes in uh, arts education in the UK in the 1950s and 60s. Um, the new foundations of theory and practice in the basic design encompassed a lot of kind of ideas that had come from the Bauhaus, like experimental compositional exercises such as the ones that are listed. 
As Pilar describes, produced on a proofing press using wood type, six to 20 line gill sands, gill bulb condensed and gill extra heavy. Wright's experiments were located in Gestalt, or the perception of pattern and structure, and the expression of sound and motion, and sound and time. In a subsequent essay on Wright, she further elaborates, consonant with these ideas, and with wood letters laid freely on the bed of the press, and printed in a rough and ready manner, was Wright's introduction of a sense of play, influenced in large part by Hutzinger's seminal study Homer Ludens. For the first time in typographic education in Britain, Wright introduces early European modernist concepts of gesture syntax relating to Dada and works by Werkman, Sandberg, Pietzwart and Theo van Dersberg. It's perhaps important to stress here that Wright's approach was underpinned by the idea of play without frivolity and the exercising of considerable restraint when it came to the indulgence of self-expression. <laughs> Pilar again says, key to Edward Wright's teaching and to his own work was a way of thinking in which he put preconception on one side to concentrate on the analysis of process and activity in order to penetrate in a structure. And this idea of structure and language we'll come back to. So exercises that started with the placing of one letter form or printed mark to, to observe how one element could destabilize space were composed in an abstract, architectural or melodic way to observe how an accumulation of other forms and marks created new relationships. By returning to first principles, Wright shifted the idea of typographic design as a modular grid or layout to the idea of an open and dynamic continuum. Pilar's assessment of the significance of these classes is unequivocal. The classes, although small and informal, were a landmark. It's a form of typographic experimentation distinct in Britain at that moment, even when compared with the approaches of those Wright was working clearly with and the early modernists he had looked back to. In her assessment, where Spencer proposed the typographic experimentation could be, could be reconciled to professional requirements, Wright was markedly both more radical and ambitious in seeking continuity with early modernism, following an approach that was expansive, constituted of imagination and capable of adapting, but ultimately more susceptible to risk. And the reach of Wright's classes was considerable if you start to map the networks of influences. Wright published the results from some of the classes as a piece called Pattern and Sound, which went in Herbert Spencer's journal Typographica. As an educator himself, he was, uh, he was appointed um, uh, a year tutor at the School of Graphic Design, the Royal College of Art. He was also teaching at the London School of Printing, which is now the London College of Communication. Subsequently became head of graphic design at the Chelsea School of Art. Um, and he was notorious for the way in which he used workshops. This image more or less shows from A to Z, it's an experimental foundation course project for potential graphic designers at Chelsea. And they were asked, to, they were required to show the relative frequency of different letters in English usage, um, which they did using letterpress. In fact, he was so notorious, he, all art colleges and printing schools in Britain had workshops and specialist technicians. As head of graphic design at Chelsea School, Wright was known to send design and typography students to the sculpture department because um, he, he really admired the, the head tutor there to, and he had sent his typography students to gain experience of designing a three-dimensional object um, from, the, from the sculpture technicians. Um, he really wanted them to have a knowledge of working with materials and crafting objects by hand. Um, this piece is by the British graphic designer Ken Garland, uh, who was one of Wright's original students, and there are plenty more examples on his website. Garland's in his 80s now. He's had the most phenomenal career, and it's really testimony to how important this workshop was that he still shows this work on his website, uh, reflecting back on his career. And Garland says of Wright, he just set up the conditions for us all to have fun and feelings and excitement and the belief that we were inventing all the time. No, that wasn't a confidence trick. It was a fruitful and considerate teaching method. And speaking for myself, it has supplied me with a head of steam that's kept me going for 30 years. Now, of course, not everyone was a fan as is clear from the following review from the designer John Sewell at the Royal College of Art, who was critical of 
what he saw as a lack of structure. Wright would have said it was all about structure, but it was perceived as not having any structure. And he says, some of Wright's, Edward Wright's lads at the Central School have had some jolly fun with wood types and shown the gimmicky quality of letters divorced from their true purpose as a means of communication. Judged by these few examples, the Wright boys are on the wrong road. Um, and actually, I would note that there were actually some girls there too. Uh, so it was the boys and girls that were on the wrong road, but if only girls had counted back then. Um, but this is a list of some of the students. And actually, what I'm trying to work out now is, uh, is just the extent of the network of influence. But this kind of represents a kind of who's who. It's a quite extraordinary sphere, sphere of influence, in some, some, including some of the most prominent names in British graphic design. We have Derek Birdsell, uh, who became a, a very successful designer in his own right, but went on to become the head of uh, the graphic design department at the Royal College of Art. He's responsible for uh, employing Alan Kitching or getting Alan Kitching to come in and set up his seminal letterpress workshop. Howell Bartram taught at the uh, London College of Communication for a long time. We have two of the original founding partners of Pentagram, Germano Facetti, who was the art director for Penguin for many years, um, Ken Garland, who went on, was a, a very successful, ran a um, design magazine, as well as being a teacher. So represented here in terms of this one small evening class, the educational reach was really phenomenal. Um, to go back to the kind of my original story and the story of the composing room at Central St. Martins, the, the St. Martins part of the story um, is in many ways more straightforward, though it also raises some questions about assumptions we can be inclined to make now of the past. Um, the designer Roy McMarba, who studied commercial art at St. Martins in 1951-3, came back to teach graphic design as the course had been renamed a day a week from 1958-59. to um, he remembers that although there were courses in commercial art and illustration, the school's emphasis was very much about fine art. There was poor technical provision in the school generally, and on the course he was teaching, the subject of typography hardly existed. An ex-student has told me that the course was very much biased towards illustration. As a teacher, Romek was concerned that students did not understand how type reached the printed page or how to specify type. He thought that a basic letterpress workshop would offer the students the hands-on experience of working with type, which would inform their ability to design and specify layouts. He suggested the idea to the head of school, who went, yep, yeah, fine. Um, and so a letterpress workshop was to be set up from scratch. And the person he turned to to help him was somebody called Desmond Jeffrey. So Des Desmond Jeffrey occupies an interesting space in British graphic design. He operates as what Robin King Ross refers to as a workshop modernist within the network of Frossel, but less programmatic. Um, Jeffrey would be described as someone engaged very much with what we would call thinking through making, um, that and an anarchist, <laughs> activist, anarchist, both. Um, through his practice, he fused workers' politics and craft, the politics of life and work for him being the same thing. He set up a print shop in Marylebone with his wife Libertad in 1956. As a real type connoisseur, he had sought out the typeface also beloved by the new wave of graphic designers, Accidents Grotesque, marketed in Britain as Standard. He was the only printers in London which had Standard. Um, and as a consequence, he became what Paul Stiff, or as Paul Stiff describes him, a furnisher of repro to the stars. Well, not all the stars. He turned quite a few stars away if he thought that they were too full of themselves. Um, Marber knew his workshop. Um, he used standard, perhaps most famously for his cover designs for um, Penguin books for Germano Fichetti, um, which are here. Romet Marber invited Desmond to set, up the to set up the letterpress at St. Martin's on Charing Cross Road, though as his wife recalls in an interview I was able to make with her a couple of years ago, Desmond started and then dumped it on me. Um, at Marber's request, she was employed by St. Martin's two days a week until 1982 to run the workshop, which held small quantities of Garamond, Gilsans and Standard. She herself, she was a refugee from the Spanish Civil War. She fled with her mother and sister into France, where she learned to set type with an elder friend of her mother's in Lyon. Age 17, and following a period of correspondence with Geoffrey, he sent her a ticket for London, uh, married her, and then she became a fellow printer to the stars, helping him run their workshop. 
as Ian McLaren recalls, having met her in the Marylebone print shop, she was markedly different to the grey-haired and or balding compositors who had taught me composing at the London School of Printing. And I think there's a whole other story there about a quite remarkable woman doing something really quite extraordinary at a time when no other women were really involved in printing in that way. But to go back to uh, St. Martin's, the St. Martin's workshop was set up expressly for graphic design students. There were none of the trade issues that they'd had at the Central School between the print students. Um, Libertad and ex-students testified to the success of the St. Martin's composing room, which thrived as an active design space within the school until the two um, colleges were merged. So from one composing room or one set of uh, uh, types and one space, it's possible to trace a network of individuals and approaches who have all contributed the to the kind of educational space which we feel so comfortable in and are able to enjoy today. This idea of a very much a hands-on pedagogy when it comes to type. Um, what can we learn? We should not assume that the ongoing location of letterpress within design teaching spaces means that designers have always had access to type. Though now often embedded within design programmes and especially graphics programmes, that's not to say that letterpress workshops have always been embedded within design education. As we've seen in the case of the Central School, letterpress was not originally intended for designers to work with. And at St Martin's it's interesting too because actually letterpress was commercially more or less redundant by the time they set up that workshop. Um, and Romek was really interested in setting it up for pedagogical purposes, not commercial purposes. In challenging the existing trade orthodoxies, these educational pioneers used letterpress to establish alternative models for the typographic training of the designer. And that these models quite considerably predate a lot of the discussions where people talk about how post-digitally letterpress has been liberated and freed. And actually when you start to look at what Wright was doing and when he was doing it, it's really significant for how early it was. And we need to be careful in our discussions, I think, on focusing too much on the post-digital potential of letterpress in design beyond its Im immediate commercial remit. And actually to explore, like I say, what people were doing long before um, digital enslavement of the designer. And I think we can acknowledge something of the debt owed to these predecessors by current generations of students and teachers. And I speak here as both a an ex-CSM student and a current tutor. Decades ago, they were negotiating uh, these fiercely protected territories of trade, typography and printing in order for me to know what I know and for me to be able to work in the way that I can now work and that I want to work, which the more I found out about them, the more remarkable and lucky I realised that we all are. And I guess in terms of exploring the legacy too, and of being here in Portugal, I wanted to acknowledge um, a debt to the work of this man, um, Robin Fior, who was a British designer, but who ended up uh, settling in Portugal, not in Porto, Lisbon. Uh, he was one of Wright's evening class students, uh, and he brought much of uh, Wright's concerns, even out of London, here to Portugal. Uh, and it's manifest through his work and it's manifest in the teaching that he was to continue once he was here. So these slides are my own truly terrible <laughs> photographs taken at the exhibition uh, Call to Action, which is on at the Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon. I think it closes on Monday. So if you want to go, you have to run. <laughs> um, this poster was a collaboration between Wright and Fior. Um, uh, Wright did the lettering. Um, the, the, the figures and, and, and a few did the rest of the design. Um, so in addition to attending the evening classes of Wright, Fior also learned from Desmond Jeffrey, um, whose workshop was coincidentally near his father's office. And as Robin King Ross gives an account, Fior quickly fell in with the milieu of uh, left-wing politics and design in London. He was a, a key member of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, he was arrested. He was part of the, 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 the sit-in. The campaign's views were publicised by demonstration, direct action, invading military installations, and using a lot of printed propaganda. Um, designers contributed by producing posters and banners to be carried on marches and in meetings. And again, that's something we'll see echoed uh, later. As 
the curator of the Gulbenkian exhibition, and I'm going to do something horrible to her name here. So uh, Anna Beliza, Beliza um, acknowledges for Fio, graphic design with a li was a linguistic practice and the designer's politics was to be found in the details and poetics. Throughout his career, he used letterpress and woodletter, especially as, as Hollis notes, he aspired to something less finished that was open for response that would allow more to be said. So this is the, uh, he worked as the designer for Black Dwarf, the uh, radical left-wing publication. And so this idea for him of, of, of letterpress allowing space for a kind of dialogue in 1972, Fior left London for Portugal, settled in Lisbon. Um, he accepted an invitation to help establish a school of art and visual communication known as ARCO. The school opened the following year and he taught there for more than 30 years. I quote Anna Beliza again, during his Portuguese years, language became central to Fior's practice. On one hand, most obviously, because Fior was now more than ever an example of the emigre designer thinking and working between two languages. Bilingual jobs gave him the opportunity of interlocking the two languages so that what is common to each and form the basis of a typographic idea. Um, Robin King Ross observes too the playful, poetic nature of Fior's work with words um, and how much he admired Edward Wright um, in his work. Like Wright, his way with text was poetic. He was aware of associations and multiple meanings in words and in images too. In conversation, he was digressive, but this tendency to wander could also impart his graphic and typographic mm. work with some richness. And anyone who's ever tried to have a conversation with Robin Field will testify to the digressive um, nature of what that was like. <laughs> Wonderful, but my goodness me. Um, so key was Field's um, continuation of his idea and concern for structure. Um, as Hollis describes, letterpress requires you, you have to think about the shape of the words first. Um, the shape of the message was determined first and the choice of typeface came later. It's not common procedure in terms of screen-based design. Um, and as Fior suggested to the Ecograda delegates in Lisbon, the mechanization takes command. For him, an analysis of the grammatical structure of the message would determine its graphic form. The structure into which the message is integrated can engage the reader actively in revealing the message. And he was really keen on how the, the folds of posters and small communications would un, unfold and literally reveal. So intricately hand-folded invitations and small posters for art galleries and cultural events revealed their messages. These he described as unfolders. It was by examining the grammatical structure, he argued that a typographic solution could be found. So, he, when he talked about his own work, he reflected on his own work. He talked about how the secret of poesis is in the making. And when I was thinking about the legacies of right, that, that hands on, the importance of the immediacy, the way that Fior is working with language and the way that they're thinking very much about the communities that they're serving. It's this idea of poesis, uh, that seems key in terms of carrying forwards, that there is meaning in making and there is meaning too in the connections with the community. Um, so the idea now is just by kind of drawing this to a conclusion is to think about how those are the threads which I see running through optimistically in terms of letterpress of the future, in, in terms of the possibilities from the past carrying through through the digital. It connects with some other writing that I've done, um, which is in celebrating practice and the possibilities for making in a design context and environment which favors strategy above making increasingly. And this is about uh, an approach to making which sees it and divorces it simply from production and sees it as an integral part of what it is to design and what it is to think through making where practice is open-ended, doing and knowing become inventive um, uh, practices. Practice is not only open-ended, it's open-started. <laughs> so the plan of a design alters in its doing, or conversely, the beginning of making with the hands enables a plan to evolve. Anyone who's ever tried to do anything with letterpress will tell you exactly that. You have a plan and then you go to the drawer 
and it's not going to happen. And actually, this is the basis of some really in interesting workshops. In the Officina Typographica di San Paolo, Marcus Mello and Claudio Hoscher run a course for letterpress for digital designers, and that's exactly their premise. The fact that when you're working with letterpress, you are continually having to recalibrate your design. It's a celebration of making which recognizes that maker intelligence is both material and conceptual. Um, and I think that often we're really good at recognizing the material intelligence, but we're not always so good at recognizing the importance of the conceptual. So um, Juliet Shen's right here, the enthusiasm for letterpress printing among designers these days stems, yes, largely from this rediscovery of what it is to work with one's hands and that you're creating uh, an object that bears the traces of its making. But it's about the conceptual importance uh, too. And I think for this reason, this is one of the reasons why I really enjoy the work of um, the printer, letterpress printer and designer Edwin Pixton, because he has a conceptual approach to exploring materiality. Um, this is one of his pieces. This is him. him. This is one gram of black ink. And there's a whole sequence of these kind of explorations of materiality, but from a very conceptual kind of perspective. Um, and it's also really important. I think we often talk about and think about an analog digital binary, but when I'm working with my students, no such thing exists. <laughs> they don't. Uh, it's all about hybridity. Um, and this idea of reverse engineering, finding out how things work, making their own tools, uh, learning through peer-to-peer -peer skill sharing really would characterize the way that making practices are starting to determine how they're operating in the studio. And uh, I think have a lot to teach us in terms of letterpress. Um, this is way, making as a way of understanding. Um, thinking about how to build and repair things. Maker culture is finding innovative, innovative ways to use, reuse and recycle all sorts of things. And of course, I <laughs> just see this picture of Daffy, uh, Kuna with, uh, yeah, with a little kind of, uh, I can't even, what are those things called? Steam rolls. Yeah, because exactly, that's what everyone has to hand. Um, but yeah, thinking about new ways of using existing tools. Um, because the future of making is in hacking, uh, or this idea. So this is two students, two graduates uh, from uh, the course I teach on. This isn't letterpress. Here they've got a knitting machine, which they've hacked, and it's knitting uh, their bibliography for the text that they're working on. But in much the same way as they've taken a knitting machine and hacked it, of course, that's what people are doing by attaching Macs to monotype casters and making them look like spacecraft. Um, and and hacking hacking is the headline here. I have to say, I'm really not sure that Eric Speakerman has invented the reinvented the printing process, but it makes a good he headline. But it is very much about hybridity and about pulling different uh, influences in in terms of thinking about how we go forward. And and this idea about how much we take from the past, we need reverence, but reverence needs to be balanced with rebellion. And we, as we interrogate our kinds of traditions, and that's where the progressive possibilities lie. So thinking about letterpress for non-graphic designers, this is back in 2010, um, this, uh, the letterpress workshop with um, Alexander Cooper and Rose Gridniff, uh, which, um, and just other students from other disciplines starting to engage. Um, so the tiger, the tiger, um, uh, which is like a kind of knitting pattern stroke. It's fusing all sorts of different ways of thinking about um, uh, uh, what letterpress could and might be. Um, hints, echoes of pixels, echoes of knitting patterns, opening up perspectives for practice beyond typography, even practice beyond graphic design. And this, this is the textile designer, Eloisa Etelvina, who's a textile designer in Sao Paulo, who's working uh, with letterpress that she's picked up and she runs in her own little tiny house. Um, the importance of the, the rebellion and finding one own space, I had no idea that Anna was going to be here when I, when I found this. Um, I've been following her, her journey through her PhD um, and the way that she's been engaging with letterpress. But I thought this was an extraordinary thing and I think really important this in this rebellion against the reverence for, but then the need to find one's own space and the possibilities for finding one's own space. 
But this idea of being granted the journeyman certificate and realising that the industrial history is not mine to appropriate, appropriate. I acknowledge that my place in history as a female self-taught printer from the other side of the digital revolution was in fact another. Uh, and actually literally playing uh, and exploring Virginia Woolf's essay of a room of one's own to find a space of her own within what it is to be a, a practitioner or work with letterpress uh, in a digital age. But there were also possibilities for finding shared spaces too, because making nowadays is very much a collaborative practice. It requires collaboration with other people and it requires collaboration with machines. Um, and the importance of maker networks, the desire to make together and in a social context is growing ever stronger. This is an example of exactly that, a maker network, um, taking advantage of digital networks of the spaces for sharing practice and knowledge. You can see how from, we did a, a, an event at um, um, St. Bride Library in 2008, seems a very long time ago at that event. The occasion, the original occasional print club, OPC members met each other, who then went on to meet several times, and that's expanded. We now have the Hamilton Ways Goose. We have the letterpress workers, plus countless other networks. So this idea of making as a kind of collaborative space is very, very much tangible and is very, very much part of the future. And it bears very, very beautiful results. Um, so this is Pat Randall uh, and... Um, working with uh, you know collaborating with other people working with double dagger um so um all of these things are coming through collaboration and through these networks and because of these communities for making to connect not just with other practitioners but making to connect to communities um, and thinking about how skilled practices serve as an anchor to the world this point of triangulation with objects and other people who have a reality of their own and here we have the link back again to Desmond Jeffrey, but also to Robin Feal, the way that Desmond Jeffrey was printing, it wasn't just about the letter forms he was printing and the relationships, but it was about a between objects and space, but it was largely about people and ideas. And then I think about what's going on and I think about lovely Federico Simatti's work in Buenos Aires and the way that he's completely committed to using letterpress in the context of his community for changing, for political change, for trying to get people to wake up to what's going on. And then, of course, we have Lotomatica in Barcelona, a collective of designers, illustrators, printing for content's sake is their mantra. Uh, thinking about the transmission of knowledge, uh, everything underpinned by a very clear political agenda in terms of disseminating, using a press to reconnect <coughs> to a community and a message and like Fio was printing for the CND, here we have Lautomatica printing uh, for the independence uh, 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 referenda in, um, in Catalonia. This is a, a, another a project about connecting to community. This is a print-based project in, uh, in Sao Paulo uh, with a print collective working with kids in a favela. Um, I went and uh, helped with some workshops with them. This is a connecting through print in a very different way the manual skills of working with letterpress, the physicality of the print process helps with poor literacy skills. Kids are coming in, they haven't got, they've got problems reading and writing, but actually they're working with solid, very real pieces of communication. Uh, and this connection of a printing press to a community, in their case, affords young people living in unbelievably awful circumstances, this opportunity to prove to everyone else that they have something worthwhile to say. So making, this is about making to care and in the context of climate emergency, the care that we take in making something properly is cousin to the care that we retain for other people, our environment and its future. But we have to think hard about our nostalgic connotations. Uh, we even have to think hard about our ethical position of just hard work is good for you. Uh, we have to become more articulate about what it is that we do and what we're offering. A fetishization of craftsmanship is a very deadly enemy of history. And to return to that idea and the mythologizing 
the past that we mythologize in relation to letterpress is actually very rarely the past that actually existed. And so finding out about what really happened can help us to shake off some of the dangers of that. And we really need to dig deeper beneath the surface of things. Um, a lot of people, when they were writing about the uh, Brazilian Princess Graphica Fidago in Sao Paulo, we love them for their imperfections and dirt. They're so charismatic compared to modern posters, but we really do need to start to try to dig deeper in terms of the way that we talk about uh, our practice and the benefits of making and what it has to contribute in the longer term, especially as we explore it through letterpress. Because, um, in the words of Jan van Torn, a liberating pedagogy should recover the forms of making and thinking um, so that they become useful again in conditions that allow for a more truly human existence, which sounds like a good thing. So wishing you all more truly human letterpress existences. Thank you.